All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm uh, Francois Tanguerelon. I'm a professor here at Osgood. I'm also the director of the Jack and May Nathanson Center on Transnational Human Rights, Crime, and Security, uh, just on the third floor here. Um, it's a great pleasure for me today to introduce uh, Jean Gabriel Castel, who is a distinguished research professor emeritus here uh, at Osgood Hall Law School uh, in New York. Uh, it's a pleasure, but it's also an honor, I'd like to say, uh, to welcome back here Professor uh, Castell, who is really such a giant of the law, uh, who's had such a distinguished career, and really has done a lot for this institution uh, here at Osgood. So just to tell you a bit about him, if you don't already know, uh, uh, given uh, the fame that surrounds him, uh, Professor Castell was born in France, received uh, several military decorations, uh, for his service with the French Resistance uh, during World War II. Um, and after the war, after having uh, earned sorry, a, a Bachelor of Science as well as two law degrees in Paris, uh, he moved to the United States on a Fulbright Scholarship, and there he did the JD at the University of Michigan as well as an SJD at Harvard Law School. In 1954, Professor Castell began, te began teaching law uh, at McGill, and in 1959, after quite a colorful story, which you just uh, told me here at the front, he accepted a position at Osgoode Hall, uh, where he taught until his retirement in 1999. Professor Castell served as editor of the Canadian Bar Review uh, for 27 years. Um, he transformed it into a bilingual, as well as a bi-jural publication, um, in order to, to reflect better Canada's national character. Uh, he also served as president of the Private International Law committee um, and uh, as well as work for the Office of Revision of the Civil Code of Quebec for 15 years uh, as an international arbitrator uh, in another of his incarnations he also participated in, in numerous uh, international arbitrations uh, he is an officer of the Order of Canada member of the Order of Ontario an officier de la Légion d'honneur an officier de l'Ordre national du mérite a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and the French Académie du Var, you get the gist. Uh, he also holds several honorary degrees. Um, he's the author of countless law books, which include a Canadian complex of laws, which you might know as the leading private international law um, textbook here in, in, in Canada. Now, so today, Professor Castel um, has kindly made time in his uh, still busy schedule, which tells me he still has an office here on the third floor uh, to come and speak to us about his current research um, in a talk entitled Full Autonomous Artificial Intelligence. Is it a threat to the human race? I'm channeling some Stephen Hawkins here. Uh, or a blessing? How can it be controlled? Without further ado, I'm going to get Well, thank you for your introduction. It's always a pleasure to come back to Osgood, except it's pretty difficult to drive here. <laughs> Took me about an hour and a half to get here. Anyway, uh, yes, I'll, uh, I always enjoy, as I say, uh, coming here. It reminds me uh, of the, the uh, time I spent here and all the facilities that uh, you're privileged to enjoy. Uh, it was quite different, actually, when I started in uh, the 1950s, but uh, Things have, uh, have improved considerably, and you have an outstanding staff. So uh, anyway, uh, the subject of uh, my talk uh, today uh, is uh, one which has uh, really developed just in the last uh, six years. Uh, until uh, 19, uh, uh, well, 2009, there was very little uh, discussion uh, with respect uh, to the subject of artificial intelligence. Even though the internet was already uh, in full swing by then, uh, but uh, in recent years, the re rapid def development of artificial intelligence and its use uh, by the military, uh, in, uh, and particularly drones and uh, some robots, has been of concern to uh, a number of scientists, engineers, philosophers, uh, and the public at large, uh, because uh, uh, the eventually uh, it was felt that in the not too distant future, uh, fully autonomous uh, machines of artificial intelligence uh, 
uh, could create an existential threat to the human race. And here I emphasize a few words. There's a fully autonomous machine of general superintelligence. Uh, fully autonomous because already you have machines which are partially autonomous, uh, particularly, for instance, drones or, uh, and even some robots. And uh, also, I'm speaking about artificial general intelligence, uh, because as we shall see in a moment, uh, it makes a difference uh, whether you are, the machine is intelligence with respect to a particular area and uh, not general like we do as humans. So is it realistic to believe that a fully autonomous machine, more intelligent than human, could take over the Earth and end life as we know it? Or is it science fiction? Now, many divergent views uh, have been expressed among artificial intelligence experts, and some believe that a human level of fully autonomous artificial intelligence could be developed uh, by 2050. And uh, a super uh, human level of intelligence uh, in all domains of interest uh, soon thereafter. Now, as mentioned uh, by my colleague here, uh, Bill Gates, uh, Elon Musk, uh, Stephen Hawkins uh, are not very uh, happy about this uh, development. They think that uh, it's very threatening, but uh, you can't stop progress, you know. But today, the most pressing issues with respect to the use of partial uh, autonomous unmanned military drones in the air and water and uh, partially autonomous robots replacing human soldiers on the battlefield are the issue that have been debated uh, uh, because of what has been taking place in Afghanistan and other parts of the world. Now here, when I speak of machines, you see, uh, you have to think in terms of a computer and uh, then the computer developed by itself uh, or with the help of a programmer, uh, a general intelligence. And uh, the question is whether you can do that in all domains. And uh, here what I'm going to do is in part one, I'm going to speak uh, to about the uh, physical and scientific aspect uh, of the road to artificial superintelligence. Then uh, in uh, part uh, two, uh, that will be the major part, I'm going to look at what type of controls, uh, if any, should be exercised over the production, the use of partially or fully autonomous machine of artificial intelligence before or after they become super intelligent. More particularly, should there be legal and ethical limits to their use, and to what extent should international play a role in this respect. Uh, then I have added a little part three, uh, which deals, which covers very briefly uh, the disruptive effects uh, of artificial intelligence on the world economy, uh, and uh, also from a social science point of view. You know what would be the consequences uh, if uh, uh, most of our activities are. Uh, are controlled or carried out by uh, robots or uh, computers. Let's look, first of all, to the road to artificial intelligence from the point of view of uh, science. Now, as you know, the human brain has capability not possessed by other living creatures, which enable the human race uh, to dominate uh, the planet. And this is due to the ability of human to think abstractly and communicate abstract thoughts to others. Humans are also able to accumulate information over the generation that preceded them. And uh, since the Industrial Revolution, the human rate of intellectual development has accelerated to the point where humans are now able to build these machines. And uh, so, uh, and the good example is, as I mentioned before, the internet, which began in 1950. Now, here I'm dividing the approach uh, into three stages. The first stage is the present stage. 
uh, presently partially autonomous machine of artificial intelligence like computers and robots are as intelligent as human, although their software limits the task they can perform. So in certain area, there's no doubt that uh, the machines are, are more intelligent than we are. But this is the extent of their autonomy, you see. They have been programmed to perform certain tasks. And uh, a good uh, and uh, human cannot outsmart di digital intelligence. A good example is, uh, for instance, the uh, uh, China Tianhe 2, whose hardware is very large, has cost uh, about 390 million to, uh, to build but it can make 34,000 trillions of operations per second. But the, uh, uh, the, this Tiananmen 2, you know, is as big as this building. And uh, it's just uh, unbelievable. Now, there is a, a quadrillion is a, hundred, a thousand trillion. So you can imagine the type of operation no human being can uh, challenge this. Uh, the Cray uh, KX, uh, XK6 is even bigger. It's uh, being built by the uh, Swiss of uh, 50 pentaflops, and a pentaflop uh, is one quadrillion, a thousand trillion. So it just blows your imagination of what we can already do at the present time. So. Uh, uh, the, uh, but as I say, the, uh, another advantage of these machines is that not only they compute faster than human brain, they can store more information, be more reliable and efficient in retrieving it, and last longer. The ability to edit and upgrade their software is another advantage. Now, we're all familiar with that. I mean, uh, we have... Uh, uh, mathematical calculation, air and other modes of transportation, reservation, email traffic, internet service, uh, automated stock trading, uh, self-driving car, wo uh, voice and face recognition, digital camera, translation, cloud computers, spam filters, any technology that, involve, that is involved in the storage and retrieval of information uh, is uh, presently uh, what you do every day with your computer. So uh, then, but what, uh, what happens is that uh, equipped with robotic bodies, these machines uh, uh, of narrow artificial intelligence can substitute for human physical and intellectual labor. You all remember that in the, uh, uh, in the plants, you know, you have artificial machines that build uh, automobiles and so on. Uh, so, uh, however, they, what is interesting is that at the present, all these machines and computers have uh, not reached the ability of doing what human can do without thinking. As long as the software of these types of machines of artificial intelligence are programmed to uh, perform only certain tasks better than human and are not fully autonomous, they do not pose any existential risk because we can control them and uh, the software, as I said, is limited. So they may be smarter than we are in certain fields, but that's it. Now, the second stage, uh, which according to those who uh, have studied the subject, uh, uh, is uh, where the uh, artificial intelligence reaches uh, the level of humans in uh, all domains. And uh, that uh, is supposed to occur uh, before 2050. And uh, so uh, the, uh, the, the machines would have the same level of autonomy and general intelligence than humans. What this machine would learn could then be passed on uh, by them to all computers of the world, creating an immense collection of digital intelligence at, this, at their disposal for future development. Then there is the final stage. The final stage is one of superintelligence. Here, uh, the uh, some human may not like it, like uh, as I said before, like uh, the. Uh, 
uh, but uh, they cannot avoid it. So that would be the creation of machine and robot capable of acquiring super intelligence, which uh, has been described by Nis Bostrom as any intellect that greatly exceeds cognitive performance of human in virtually all domains of interest. After having originally programmed to reach a level of human general intelligence and autonomy, the machine would reprogram themselves, rewrite their software over and over at computer speed. Uh, they would be self-teaching uh, themselves uh, and uh, improve themselves. And uh, as a result of these recursive self-improvement, uh, some of you were scientists, well, we'll remember the Turing uh, uh, discussion as to the, this recursive self-improvement, which uh, would lead to an intelligence explosion, and they would become more intelligent than human. Now, fully autonomous and free from the instruction of their original software, they would be able, you see, to protect themselves against any attempt uh, to be turned off by human, because some have said, well, all you have to do is to turn the switch off, and then the electricity doesn't come in, and then your computer uh, doesn't work, or the machine doesn't work. But since they are more smarter than us, they would find a way uh, to avoid this and operate uh, uh, at will. Now, with superintelligence comes power. Once fully operative, uh, the superintelligence, fully autonomous machine or robot, especially if it's a single one, a singleton, as it's called in the trade, with no external opponent, would be the most powerful being in the history of life on the Earth. The attainable advantage of machine, artificial intelligence, hardware, and software available to it would be unlimited, with the ability to change or destroy humanity. And therein lies the existential threat uh, to the human race. Once we share the planet with machines more intelligent than we are, we would face a technological singularity, as we would no longer be able to predict uh, what the future would bring us beyond the event horizon. Remember, those who are, know a little bit of astronomy, you know, the black uh, holes, you know, where Everything comes in, and it's just uh, nothing can come out. And uh, so uh, the, uh, the event horizon is where the light can no longer, the light can no longer escape. Uh, and uh, in, if you uh, sort of make the analogy with artificial intelligence, once uh, these uh, machines have reached that stage, uh, what happened? You know? uh, this is where superintelligence uh, uh, reaches uh, infinity, and uh, nobody knows what's after that. The same as no one knows what uh, uh, is uh, after the thing has gone into the, uh, the black hole. Now, the question is whether my machines, starting with a level of general in intelligence, how can they achieve superintelligence? without the intervention of a programmer in the same way as blind evolutionary process resulted in the present level of human general intelligence. So uh, there are several possibilities you see here. It's also possible for a programmer to develop a genetic evolution algorithm uh, to run on a super fast computer in order to achieve results comparable to those of biological evolution. And another method would be for a programmer uh, to evolve uh, a human level of artificial intelligence to super intelligent by starting with the human brain as a template. This means thinking of human ter in human terms, because the artificial super intelligence of machine may not necessarily evolve on its own the way we evolve, and uh, it may move in a different direction than human intelligence and may end up with a cognitive architecture, uh, values, goals, and emotion, unlike those of humans. So these three phases, you see, of evolution of uh, artificial intelligence, the last one is the dangerous one because there uh, 
we don't know what's going to happen, and they have absolute power. So that brings me to the, uh, to the legal part, and this what type of control can be exercised over the production of and use of partially or fully autonomous machine or artificial intelligence before and after becoming super intelligent. Now here, uh, we are going to move into a very interesting aspect uh, of uh, Human Rights Watch. They, uh, uh, they have expressed doubts as to whether partially or fully autonomous machine uh, taking the place of human uh, uh, could uh, 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 act in such a way as respecting the international humanitarian obligation which you find uh, uh, in various international uh, uh, treaties, uh, conventions, uh, uh, with respect to the duty to protect civilian. Uh, already, you see the uh, use of lethal, partially or fully autonomous robotic system on the ground, air, and sea is quite extensive in various parts of the world, such as Afghanistan, Ukraine, Pakistan, Iraq, Syria, Somalia, Yemen, uh, primarily against ISIS the Taliban or Al-Qaeda and other terrorist uh, and rebel groups. Uh, but uh, these weapons uh, have not always given their user an asymmetric advantage. And also, uh, on many occasions, there have been a lot of collateral damage. So the issue here uh, that has concerned uh, various uh, uh, international groups uh, uh, is uh, with respect to lethal autonomous weapon system. For instance, could uh, unmanned, partially or fully autonomous robots and drones reliably separate enemy soldiers or terrorists from civilian on the battlefield or elsewhere? Would their lack of human emotion prevent them from showing mercy or compassion when facing wounded or surrendering human soldiers or civilian victims. So far, scientists, uh, computers, engineers, and programmers have not yet succeeded in developing software or source code that contain new cognitive modules and skill enabling robots to feel emotion, such as compassion for human, or even for other robots, general concern for humans and their welfare, scientific curiosity, moral goodness, which are some of the attributes of human. However, since science of artificial intelligence has not yet reached uh, the <coughs> physical limits of technology, it is probably that in the future programmers will impart in robots legal and ethical value based on international humanitarian law. <coughs> in fact, uh, uh, I was reading in the Scientific American last week uh, that uh, uh, we were, some people, some scientists have almost perfected a method where they could infuse in our human brain all the knowledge of the world. So that uh, uh, <laughs> that would be a counter argument about robots. We would be at least as, most, as powerful as robots eventually. Another important issue is whether autonomous robots or drones equipped with a quick, do quick draw response can be trusted. Uh, you know, in the spur of the moment, what, what are, when you have to make a decision quick without thinking, uh, can uh, a robot do that? They may become too creative and not follow orders. More generally, will war, and this is one of my concerns, will war waged by remote control become too easy and too tempting? since robots will save human lives by dispensing with the use of humans on the battlefield. Knowing that the only entity at risk are machine, there will be little incentive to settle dispute by diplomacy or other non-lethal method. Uh, war could become trivialized as a global spectator sport to be watched on a laptop, computer, iPhone, or television. Be entertainment on the weekend to see uh, the, and that reminds me a little bit also, uh, remember in the Bible there when uh, uh, <coughs> David is fighting Goliath, 
uh, the giant, you know, the, the fate of the two countries depending upon the outcome of that. And in the olden days, there were a lot of battles that were waged only by champions on either side. Uh, so uh, there, the new champions would be the robots, the better robots on, the, uh, on either side. So uh, it's, uh, it's quite uh, frightening. Anyway, considering that a large number of states are now working on autonomous autonomous lethal weapons, including robots, the high contracting parties to the convention on certain conventional uh, weapons uh, <clears throat> extreme, uh, extremely injurious uh, have met on several occasions. And uh, recently, uh, as I say, this is all new uh, in 2013, 2014, uh, they are considering whether the production and use of lethal <coughs> autonomous weapon systems should be prohibited in all circumstances. Uh, finally, a consensus seemed to have emerged. They're going to have a meeting on April 13, 2015, just uh, next month. And uh, a consensus seems to have emerged that work on lethal autonomous weapons should continue in order to reach a definite commitment that the use of any weapons requires meaningful human control. Uh, so uh, the question, of course, is whether the states uh, that haven't signed all these conventions, the humanitarian convention and so on, or ev avoid them, uh, would uh, go for this. Now, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, that would be to uh, uh, create, uh, as you know, this convention, uh, uh, has a number of protocols. Uh, one, uh, they deals with uh, uh, various, I have the list here, there are about uh, four of them. Uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, the non-detectable fragments, mines and booby traps, incendiary weapons, blinding laser weapons, and explosive remnant of war. And that would be the uh, six uh, would deal with lethal unmanned uh, 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 artificial weapons. The difficulty, of course, would be to enforce such prohibition or restriction, since practically any computer engineer with a personal computer could work privately and secretly for states, even signatory states, uh, to develop uh, uh, the needed uh, uh, hardware. We have at the moment uh, this settlement about atomic weapons with Iran, but uh, uh, Iran could very well, you know, uh, develop uh, uh, these weapons uh, secretly. So the system of uh, surveillance, I mean, there are precedent with respect to chemical, biological, nuclear weapons, the use of which has been banned or restricted. There are all kinds of the conventions. Uh, they're listed here. I'm not going to go over them. But the uh, system of surveillance, uh, verification and control uh, of uh, uh, these various weapons uh, uh, could be, particularly nuclear weapons, could be used. But again, as I said, it would be, it is doubtful that this system would be sufficient to prevent uh, cheaters from obtaining definite strategic advantage over non over complying states. So, uh, plus, uh, there may not be a, any unanimity. If you look at all these conventions, biological, uh, chemical, nuclear weapons, and so on, you will see, for instance, that not, they are not signed by all states. Uh, take, for instance, the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. It's signed by all major powers, uh, except India, Pakistan, Israel, uh, South Sudan, and uh, North Korea has just, uh, well, uh, in, four years ago, has uh, denounced uh, the, uh, the non-proliferation treaty. So uh, unless you reach unanimity, there will always be some states that are going to uh, evade uh, those uh, regulation or rules uh, and uh, develop uh, the uh, super intelligent uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, machines or robots. Now, although the, uh, the, the use of partially or fully autonomous lethal weapons is not absolutely prohibited 
uh, international lawyers uh, know that uh, there is something that is called international customary uh, use in bellow, including convention, the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, which uh, prohibit the Hague Convention, for instance, uh, respecting the laws of wars, and then the Geneva Convention on uh, uh, humanitarian law. Uh, but uh, even in the absence of this convention, even if you haven't signed uh, them, uh, you have this uh, customary uh, international law. And uh, for instance, it says the right to be, uh, of belligerent to adopt means of injuring the enemy is not unlimited. Uh, robots, drones, and other lethal or partially fully autonomous weapon system must comply with the rules of distinction, proportionality, military necessity, humanity in the conduct of a civil or international war, and that which always requires uh, uh, a distinction uh, uh, between civilians and, uh, uh, and the soldiers. And so uh, uh, again there, the question is whether a robot, uh, unmanned, robot can is capable of distinguishing between civilian and military target and uh, the proportionality and military necessity means that the use of force must be weighed against the possibility of collateral damage to civilians in other words the use of force must not be excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage anticipated so uh, the uh, you have here, finally, the general principle of humanity. Uh, uh, again, those of you who know international law, the Martin's Clause, uh, which uh, re dictates uh, that uh, uh, sh people should carry, a, a belliger that belligerent should uh, uh, act in accordance with public conscience. Now, would autonomous machines be able to do such an evaluation? and saying, well, we must act uh, according to the dictates of human conscience? I doubt it. Uh, already semi-autonomous drones have caused several collateral damage to civilians in the tribal areas of Northwest Pakistan and in Afghanistan. Then uh, there's also the International Criminal Court. The International Criminal Court doesn't deal with state, it deals with individual uh, which uh, have uh, violated uh, have caused genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity. Uh, what if these machines have uh, committed those crimes? Can they be prosecuted? No, they cannot be prosecuted because the uh, court has only jurisdiction over natural persons. These machines cannot be held personally criminally responsible, but then who is responsible? Who could be held criminally responsible? The programmer, the superior controlling the machines, the military commander employing this method of warfare, mm -hmm. the political leader, such as the head of state, ordering the military commander to resort uh, to, uh, uh, to this. You see that the decision uh, is uh, uh, to uh, prosecute uh, the, is quite a difficult one. Prosecutor would have to prove that the crimes alleged to have been committed by these machines, first of all, are crimes within the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, and that the person alleged to be responsible for their use understood the consequences of their decision in order to meet the criterion of mens rea, the intention, the intent to, uh, of wrongdoing. Uh, Another way of uh, dealing with uh, 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 of robots uh, of uh, superior or equal intelligence would be uh, uh, the law of state responsibility. Here we're not dealing with individuals that have committed crimes against humanity. We're dealing with the state uh, that uh, has uh, started a program, like say, of, uh, uh, of eliminating uh, uh, people like genocide and so on. Now, wrongful acts or omissions, whether criminal or civil in nature, that violate international law, uh, especially international humanitarian law, which would be, uh, which would be uh, done by a partially autonomous machine, 
uh, may also engage the responsibility of the state owning them or using them uh, because the uh, statute of the International Criminal Court uh, says that uh, uh, relating to individual criminal responsibility does not affect the responsibility of states under international law. So under the uh, International Criminal Court statute, you can get an individual. Then under state, the law of state responsibility, then you can get the state that use uh, these uh, uh, person to commit crime. So to, to obtain full reparation, the human victim would have to prove that these act or omissions were attributable to the state or one of its organ and or representative. Now this would be quite difficult from the point of view of proof, you see, uh, because uh, particularly if you're dealing with rogue, there could be, uh, there could be uh, robots that would be programmed by criminal organization, for instance, uh, where they would not contain any limits into what they can do. And uh, so how are you going to attribute responsibility to the states uh, when uh, they are unable to control effectively uh, these robots? Uh, then there's Article 36 uh, of uh, Protocol 1 of uh, the Geneva Convention for the Protection of Victims of International Conflicts, which says that before adopting a new weapon, uh, the state that has developed that new weapon, that new lethal weapon, must uh, examine it in the light of international law in order to determine whether or not uh, it violates uh, any of the Human Rights Convention. Uh, <clears throat> now, fully autonomous lethal weapon system presently in existence, as I said earlier, uh, do not pose existential risk for humans since their autonomy is programmed only to perform certain tasks. However, uh, it is suggested that Canada should be uh, very aware of this and should cooperate in uh, making sure that at all times they are kept under a human control. I looked at all the discussion that took place uh, uh, in Geneva on this, and I must say that uh, I didn't find any comments by any Canadian representatives uh, uh, at, uh, at those discussions, although Canada is part of the group that has signed uh, the uh, Convention on uh, uh, Dangerous Weapon. Uh, uh, now, the European Union, just a little word because uh, uh, about the uh, European Union. Well, the military side, the European has been concerned with unmanned weapon system and has declared a, a priority of European foreign policy. And uh, there is a consensus that is uh, developing uh, that uh, none of these weapons uh, uh, that should uh, be without the control of, uh, the, uh, uh, of humans. Uh, also, the European Union on the civilian side, it's quite interesting, uh, in the field of robotics, has been concerned uh, with uh, uh, the, uh, what uh, robots can be doing, particularly in the field of uh, the medical field. And uh, so uh, there they have come to the, the conclusion that uh, uh, it would not be advisable for the European Union to adopt uh, a robotic law, Lex Robotic, as they call it, and because it would be better to take each separate problems and deal with it uh, uh, and, and not have a general law of robotics applying uh, because they, f they maintain that the field of robotic is too broad and the range of legislative domain affecting robotics too wide uh, to have a Lex Robotica because this would have a chilling effect uh, on innovation. <clears throat> now, what else can we do? Well, what is interesting is that except for Nick Bostrom of the Center for the Study of Existential Risk, uh, uh, the Institute on the Future of Humanity and the Institute of Future of Life, uh, uh, no state so far has been concerned or even human rights organization uh, with the consequences of a possible evolution of autonomous uh, artificial in general intelligence to super intelligence. 
And uh, I feel that uh, this is wrong. I think it should be addressed long before uh, scientists, computer engineers, and programmers, at the request of any state, succeed in creating a single or multiple super intelligent robot or machine uh, capable of controlling the planet. A radical way, of course, would be to prevent this from happening uh, by all the states agreeing, like Hawkins proposes it, to prohibit the creation of fully autonomous super intelligent machine. And uh, however, this is unlikely since history has shown that it is futile to control evolution of technology by blocking research. A uh, powerful state like the USA, like China and Russia uh, would want to be free to develop artificial autonomous machine of general intelligence uh, capable of becoming super intelligent because this would give them a definite uh, economic advantage. Uh, now, super uh, intelligent machines motivated uh, uh, by uh, uh, widely shared human ideals could be beneficial by controlling the more dangerous aspect of emerging technology and thus reduce existential risk created by them. Uh, personally, I feel that better than prohibiting or restricting research and development of autonomous artificial super intelligence by way of international convention, which are difficult to monitor and control, a better solution would be for all the members of the United Nations to collaborate in such research and development. And this they have already done, you see, in the International Space Station, uh, the Human Genome uh, Project, the Large Hadron a particle accelerator. Obviously, collaboration, which may be easier among allies, would be excellent, considering the enormous security implication of artificial super intelligence uh, for the whole of humanity. And if you look at the participant, they can do that on Google, yeah, of the International Space Station uh, Human Genome Project, you will see that uh, there are a large number of uh, states that have including uh, China and Russia and the United States. So there is a possibility there uh, of uh, uh, having all these states collaborate. And this brings us to the, the second aspect of this collaboration. Uh, what would be found, I suggest, uh, should be considered as the common heritage of mankind not to be appropriated or developed by any individual state or natural or juridical person, but used for peaceful purpose uh, for the benefit of mankind by pl uh, public or private organization or commercial enterprises, which would then be licensed uh, uh, to use uh, uh, these robots or super intelligent uh, machines uh, uh, for uh, the, uh, uh, the development of the economy and so on. Another desirable approach uh, to prevent undesirable outcome from the evolution of artificial general intelligence to uh, super intelligent would be to uh, limit uh, uh, what this machine of general intelligence can do by engineering their motivation system and goals in the hope that they would continue to abide by them once they become super intelligent. And here, uh, I read, uh, well, I read them when I was a kid too, uh, the science fiction writer Isaac Asimov, Asimov uh, in the famous thing, uh, 1942 short story, Run Around I, in I, Robot. Uh, he says, a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. A robot must obey the orders given to it by human being except where such orders would conflict with the first law. Thus, when writing software for autonomous artificial machine the, of general intelligence aspiring to become super intelligent, uh, we could incorporate in the software the two Asimov, Asimov laws, as well as the general principle of law recognized by civilized nation. That's the statute of the International Court of Justice and human and ethical principles and moral values. And uh, at the moment, programmers are on the way to doing that. The question is which human ethical principle and moral values in general will be chosen by the programmer and coded in light of the diversity of cultures, legal regime, 
religions, uh, political ideology. Probably only universal norms, I suggest, would be acceptable found in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Economic and Social Cultural Rights, uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and so on. Uh, the, uh, and also uh, the Convention on the Prevention of uh, uh, and Punishment of Genocide, the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel and Inhuman, inhuman and Degradation Treatment or Punishment. Now, if instead of the creation of a single super intelligent machine, scientists, computer engineers, and programmers at the request of individual state create several super intelligent machines competing with one another, humanity might end up with machines con containing conflicting sets of human laws and human principles, ethical values, or moral values. So diversity would prevail over universality. How would this machine interact? To solve this problem, they could decide to reject all human laws, ethical principle, and moral value and replace them by their own. Uh, rogue machines of super intelligence could also be created without any human ethical principle and moral values in their software. So uh, some have suggested, well, why not confine the first super intelligent machine to an isolated computer? But this is not the solution. Being super intelligent, it could easily escape uh, uh, that uh, uh, computer, uh, using its hacking superpowers to escape its confinement and spread all over the internet and expand its software uh, and hardware capacity. So these are, in my opinion, some of the things that you should look at uh, in order to uh, control or attempt to control, because I don't think that we can stop it, uh, to control uh, super intelligent machines once uh, they have reached that stage. And this brings me to part three and then the conclusion. Uh, part three uh, of uh, my talk, uh, it deals with the disruptive technology, the economic and social aspect of the digital revolution and artificial intelligence. Uh, the digital revolution and artificial superintelligence can be compared to the industrial revolution when machine replaced human workers and had a dramatic effect on their employment. The industrial revolution resulted in an educational revolution to retrain workers for, in, for a job in other parts of the economy. This is what happened also in the economic union uh, where uh, a lot of unprofitable or uh, uh, factories and so on were closed and replaced uh, and, the, and, the, uh, and the, the workers there were retrained. Now, the, uh, of course, uh, the uh, uh, difficulty here is that uh, the uh, the technological unemployment due to new discovery to economize the use of labor may outrun the pace at which we can find users for labor. We may innovating ourselves toward unprecedented economic upheaval due to artificial intelligence, robotic 3D printers, nanotechnology, gene, gene editing, uh, for instance, uh, <coughs> Uh, artificial intel intelligence may program 3D printers to create new generation of robots, which in turn will build 3D printers and so on. That, and so it will go on and on. The, uh, uh, also different from the Industrial Revolution, information te technology like artificial intelligence is not restricted just to factories and, and the cars and, uh, and so on, it is ubiquitous and will invade every employment sector of the economy, including services, and make virtually every industry less labor intensive. A white collar job or a college or university degree will no longer be any protection from automation. Uh, this is particularly true with respect to artificial intelligence, which makes it <coughs> possible for a computer to perform complex tasks uh, <clears throat> and uh, for which they were not specifically programmed. And once they reach super intelligence, they can do anything they want, you see. And uh, 
even today, you see global finance uh, is using uh, high frequency trading uh, algorithm, uh, which accounts for three quarter of all stock trades on the New York Stock Exchange. The software used in self-driving cars will displace millions of human jobs. In manufacturing, artificial intelligent technology has already pushed human aside and it makes more product with fewer people. This will also be replicated in the service industry. If so, where will these human displaced go? What should they do? Where would they move on? Well, how will society prepare for this upheaval? 200 years ago, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the US uh, engaged in a parallel revolution in education known as the Common School Movement, <coughs> where all children are to be trained in public school uh, and uh, become capable workers. At the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we needed a new <coughs> uh, rev uh, education revolution to keep up uh, with it. But we should do the same today with the, in the, with the digital revolution. Our students are only prepared for job in the wrong century at the moment. Adapting to the new en environment and cultivating soft skills in which humans have a competitive advantage over artificial machines, like asking questions, planning, creative problem solving, empathy, and elder care. This is a whole new field, especially also for lawyers. Uh, I'm probably going to give a, a course on that at uh, Ryerson this uh, fall. Uh, we must train our youth for new roles as new technology can open new opportunities by lowering the bar to position previously requiring years of training. Like take the, fil the, the film of uh, the uh, area of the medical uh, uh, sciences. Well, new technology are, are just enabling a lot of people who don't have to go to medical school for a number of years uh, to they get it on the on the uh, on the internet immediately and it shows exactly what you have to do and so uh, uh, there are lots of things that can be done uh, today without having to uh, go to years of study so lots of job will not disappear but change as a human and a computer can complement each other in a lot of areas. <clears throat> now, however, still some people will be unemployed. Some economists have suggested to give them a universal basic income. I understand that Ontario is planning to do that. Uh, Finland is also planning uh, to give this a guaranteed income to everyone. Another solution would be to resort to a negative income tax uh, uh, this is not socialism, as the government does not take over the means of production and allocates resources. The nature of work may also need to be reevaluated. For instance, a four days work week or a limited of hours per week, like in France, uh, 35 hours, uh, they may offer a partial solution. Finally, and this I'm looking at the benefits, because so far I have looked at things that are uh, rather negative with respect to artificial superintelligence. But what if no one can find work and technology and artificial intelligence leads to a world of abundance? Obviously, we would not want our lives to be controlled by a few trillionaires with an army of robots. However, like Star Trek, we could live in a post-money economy and society where there is no need to earn a living. All our needs would be provided for by robots. People would be, in, would be able to do what they enjoy doing, not what they need to be doing. You would work only because you want to, otherwise everything is done for you. Perhaps we should look forward to the day where no one will have to work again. Is this a blessing? <coughs> Some kind of utopia of a wonderful world in which nanotechnology allows us to integrate with the robots. We would be just uh, part, and, and one example is the one that I mentioned earlier, where you have the, uh, uh, you have the uh, uh, implant in your brain, all the knowledge of the world, you know. Uh, so uh, you share with your robots. 
To conclude, I say, with the scientific community being more global and competitive, it is inevitable that whatever can be done with respect to artificial intelligence will be done somewhere by someone. States are always anxious to be first to acquire and develop new technology. <clears throat> the uh, formally or informally agreed protocol or regulation on the national or international level, as well as technical, legal, ethical, and moral rules, uh, uh, could be inserted by programmers in the software uh, of, and should be able to uh, uh, control uh, and avoid a doomsday catastrophe caused by a single or several of these machines having evolved to super intelligence. But <clears throat> the, face of the fate of humanity must not depend on the action of fully autonomous super intelligent machines. This is why international law, in my opinion, has an important role to play when programming and controlling those machines. Superintelligence is a most important challenge, but it may not be an absolute priority. Now, because there are more immediate existential threats that are posed by nuclear weapons, look at what's happening in North Korea, the reluctance on the part of the major power to disarm further, climate change, uh, also gene editing technology, CRISPR case uh, uh, 9 nanotechnology and other technology, including the present use of unmanned, partially autonomous military drones and robots. Uh, vigilance is important for if the human race succeed in creating fully autonomous super intelligent machines, they would be capable of determining the planet's future and threatening its civilization very existence. The stakes are high. It is hoped that the United Nations and individual states, especially Canada, will work di diligently and cooperatively to eliminate this probability long before the advent of fully autonomous, super intelligent machines. So I leave it to you uh, to decide whether we're doomed or, well, or whether we're going to live in a wonderful world of abundance where nanotechnology allows us to integrate ourselves with computers and share our future with them. But my conclusion is that whether we like it or not, we are going to have to share our future with uh, <coughs> super intelligent, uh, super artificial intelligent machines. Thank you. So thank you, Professor Castell, for what was indeed a very provocative talk. In fact, I don't think I've ever heard a more provocative talk in my years at Osgood. And so we have some time for questions. I'm sure that there'll be some, or at least reactions. Um, uh, I, before uh, we do yes. that, I want to precise, I have a Bachelor of Science, but that was about 60 years ago. I'm close to 90, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> So these things didn't exist. So I'm not pretending what I did was in biology, but at that time it was quite in its, in its infancy. So I don't ask me technical question on that because I, I did my research, but I'm not an expert on that in spite of my background in science. Sorry. <laughs> Initial caveat, we're recording the talk, so whenever you're asking a question, make sure you have a microphone in your hand. So I'm going to start with you. Sagi Perry. Right, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, I have to admit that I have no knowledge of uh, this field of uh, uh, super intelligent uh, uh, beyond the, uh, my recollection of uh, the uh, Terminator movie, Terminator 2. I think it was uh, 1989 uh, uh, when the uh, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's quest was to destroy artificial arm, which in future will lead to uh, super intelligence. Uh, so, but uh, here are my observations on, uh, on, on, on your talk. Uh, uh, first, uh, I, I think you, uh, actually you are right, uh, uh, altogether with the international community, that uh, this artificial intelligence, super intelligence, is a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous thing uh, that we should uh, prevent. Uh, uh, the whole idea of law uh, seems to be built on the idea of uh, human rationality. Uh, moral judgment, and uh, once we have a machine which is capable, uh, capable uh, uh, to certain actions, 
uh, capable uh, to uh, uh, to uh, to take control uh, of the world. Of the world, this seems to be actually very dangerous. Uh, even we will establish a, a control, certain uh, supervision of another machine. On that machine, there will be a question: Who going to supervise and control the controlling machine? So actually, I do agree that this, this is a problem, and I do agree that this is a problem that probably international community should deal with. Now, uh, several things. Uh, first, it's a it's a question of technology because technology innovation seems to be a good thing. Technology helps us. Technology uh, saves a lot of lives. Technology saves our time. We cannot pre prevent technological progress. This is clear. But here's the problem. Uh, we might try to control uh, the artificial intelligence, but the technology does not go in a st steady way. The technology development goes this way. It's going up in, the, uh, up in, in, in significant steps. So. From a technological perspective, it seems to be might be a problem to clearly to control the development. We might uh, cross the line of artificial intelligence uh, without, uh, 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 without a clear acknowledgement that we actually just crossed the line. And I think there's a problem here, significant problem from technological perspective. How we actually can be sure that we do not cross this line. Now, uh, my other comments, it's about your uh, point of international cooperation, and I think this is the right things to do. Because in uh, contemporary worlds, we have many so-called global problems, such as problem of drugs, problem of, of antitrust, a problem of uh, global warming, and this is the right things to do. The right things to do is global cooperation, and this is exactly the way where the international law, international community, a, a United Nation is heading for. It's heading to cooperation, it's heading to participation, collaboration, and so on. So I think you're actually absolutely right. This is about cooperation, and this is in, in line with the international community. My only uh, 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 suggestion would be a establishment of clear framework to deal with that. You, was, you mentioned the uh, uh, Convention for uh, pl uh, pl uh, uh, Proliferation of Nuclear Weapon. Uh, little weapon uh, 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 framework, I think this will be wrong. I think the right things to do is actually establishment uh, a framework, specific framework for artificial intelligence. Because uh, the lessons of uh, reality uh, teach us that we actually need specific framework for specific problems. I will give you an example. Uh, we have international law provisions with a deal with uh, crimes against humanity they generally do not cover the case of mass rape. And it's proof, it has been proved that we actually need, spe we need actually specific provision, specific, uh, uh, specific uh, uh, wording to deal with specific uh, uh, problem. That is why my suggestion would be actually a clear convention, specific convention, which address this specific problem of artificial intelligence. So uh, this is uh, more or less uh, uh, my comments, and thank you so much again for your talk. Well, I think your idea of having a special convention just dealing with artificial intelligence uh, should be explored. That's, uh, the question is then how many states will go for it, and uh, <laughs> that's uh, because, I mean, there are many benefits from artificial Super intelligence that uh, that a state can derive from by developing one of those uh, machines or robots or whatever you want to call it. Uh, so uh, uh, again, you know, when you look at uh, these various conventions, not every state has. Uh, I mean, the the, U the, U the United States, Russia, and China are not even part of the uh, uh, the International Criminal Court. You know, so. That's, uh... So I, I have a thought, and now I'm going to move on to you. So, so you, you frame the problem in terms of an existential threat. You said the future of the human race is at stake. Now, clearly, you think that this is something that is extremely valuable. Now, I think you were right towards the end of your talk to say, well, that's right, that might be an existential threat. 
But there are many other kinds of existential threats, and then we, we might need to decide how we're going to try to prioritize how we address various threats. So climate change, we don't seem to be very good at, at dealing with it. Nuclear weapons, where there were things that were done in the past, right? So a convention, uh, different kinds of policy like mutually assured destruction, it seems to have, have forestalled the, the, the risk up till now. But you seem to say, well, there is always a risk, right? And law can only go so far. Right? You, you, you seem to say, well, there's always the march of progress. We can always, this, we always run the risk that these machines, and so far as it's technologically possible, are going to take over. Right? And so I was surprised in your talk that you didn't suggest, if only as a conclusion, that one thing that we should do outside the legal regime is simply prepare for the, inventor, the eventuality that they indeed try to take over and simply prepare for war. Right? Because that seems to be, if really the existence of humanity is at stake, which is what you might think, you might think that. that the ultimate ground of, of value, uh, at least in our world, perhaps in the universe, if there are no other intelligent beings around, then I, I'm just wondering, when you ask the question, how should it be controlled? Well, we should plan for the worst eventuality. So, so if you choose to be as provocative as you are, weren't you choosing to also suggest the most provocative kind of, or, 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 or to go as far as one might need to, to preserve that value? Well, the danger, of course, is that, uh, I mean, you can't stop progress, so there will be, uh, uh, artificial superintelligence will come. Uh, I'm absolutely convinced of that. But what happens when the computer wakes up there, the superintelligent computer wakes up and sees that it is controlled by a human? Do you think they'll go for it? They might say, the hell with you. We're, we can do everything we want. And the best is to get rid of human. And that's where the uh, the existential well, risk. But your suggestion, <laughs> well, how do you how do you prevent them from reaching that stage? That's uh, that, that's your question. Yes, I, thank you again for the talk. Um, it was very provocative. Uh, my question goes to maybe speaks a little bit to your experience in the French Resistance and uh, uh, connected to awareness. Really, is the heart of the question. So, and the question is really this: if, if this is such. Uh, uh, you know, a, a potential problem on a global scale, an existential threat, as you as you call it, uh, and even if some public figures like Elon Musk and uh, and others have come out and said that this is this could be that that scale of a problem, uh, my question to you is, um, why why is do you think there's such a lack of awareness and discussion dialogue about this problem or potential problem, and uh, then perhaps what would your recommendation be for the people in this room uh, in encouraging that dialogue? Well, the, uh, I would say that, uh, I think in my little section on uh, economic and social, I think that you as future lawyers and, uh, uh, or even in all the professions, because it's so ubiquitous that, uh, you know, artificial intelligence already affects so many different fields that uh, we, uh, you guys and myself wasn't, but we were, we are not prepared for that uh, digital revolution. And uh, the, uh, the system of education that we have, you know, was for another century. And uh, we have to uh, uh, have courses here in law, in uh, in uh, technology, in the science and everything, and starting even at the grammar school, not just the three R's, but uh, get, I mean, when you see, I was watching a couple of uh, my friends who have kids that are two years old and they're already playing with, uh, with a computer, you know, and they were just even, they were learning how to, uh, to spell the words and things like that, they're just two years old. We got to adapt to this new revolution and because the, uh, uh, the uh, digital revolution was like the uh, uh, the uh, industrial revolution, except it's much wider, you know. And so, uh, uh, what uh, the Americans did at the time of the industrial revolution in the nineteenth century was to very few people at the time went to school. Only the rich people went to school, uh, whose <laughs> children went to school. And, and the, uh, there's a whole history of the development of education in the United States where the, uh, uh, this, uh, they started a whole program to, uh, to, uh, uh, to give education to everyone of every classes of society. Maybe not at the university level, but certainly at the uh, uh, high school level. 
Now today, a high school degree is worth nothing because uh, even a university degree, you know. And, uh, so uh, I think that it's very important, even in law, especially in law, international law, but even if you look at what the European Union is doing there uh, in the private field, uh, all this, uh, there should be a course here uh, on, uh, the dean is here, you know, he's not here anymore, but there should be a course on, uh, on uh, the consequences of robotics and, and uh, digital uh, things, because uh, otherwise you're not going to be prepared uh, uh, for tomorrow, you know, where it's becoming more and more difficult. And so I mentioned some of the things that could be done where you can cooperate, you see that we still, as human, we have a lot of things we can do with the help of robots, uh, with uh, uh, not rob artificial intelligence. So by combining ourselves with them, taking, not taking advantage, but just, you know, inter, uh, intercourse in, uh, with robots, not a physical one, uh, is, is what we, uh, what, that's the future. And so I'm not really that worried about the control in the end, uh, because, uh, I mean, look at when you can have someone who is more intelligent. I know in my own life, I, I always try to associate it with people who are more intelligent than I was, because that's the way I learned something. And that's what you should all do, you know, try to be with people who are uh, more intelligent than you are, because then you, you're going to benefit from it, you know. And so uh, robots can help you a lot, you know, once. And if those doctors that are working are trying to impart, maybe not all the knowledge of the world, but in your field, you know, you don't even have to go to law school. You'll have it all there. One. But all this to say, you know, I'm maybe exaggerating or hoping for the impossible, but I think that uh, you guys have to move forward with artificial intelligence and take advantage of it and be prepared for it. And I don't think that our schools at the moment, at any level or university, are really, maybe in the, the science department, but they're doing some work on that. But I'm thinking of everyone having at least a minimum basic training in, uh, uh, in technology. Yes. Um. Yes, uh, just thank you for a really interesting talk. Um, first of all, I think I might try and, you know, I'm not sure if I'm gonna take you out of your element with your question, but it relates more to your third part of your, your lecture. Um, and we've been discussing a lot of sort of philosophical issues, but maybe something that I uh, maybe brings more of a common law or practitioner perspective. Um, say for example, um, if you don't mind, I'm gonna sit down. No problem. Um, I guess my question is, say for example, if we're dealing with uh, Google driverless cars or Amazon's uh, delivering packages via drones, right? And there is some sort of accident and there's a harm caused or there's deaths. Um, and so at that particular moment as a lawyer um, who has a client who wants to sue and seek a remedy, right? So there, one way, I mean, if you look at litigation in the private law context is suing the corporation. Um, I guess what I'm getting at here is I'm wondering if we need to develop, this may be a complement to your international theme, in terms of creating a federal body that regulates algorithmic safety. Um, so whether that would be independent of, say, for example, with the drones, whether aviation regulation can cover certain harms that may happen with a regulatory offense under that, or with the traffic laws. But if you think federally trying to regulate algorithmic safety in terms of um, the use of predictive algorithms that are in our lives much more frequently than, say, the, the lethal soldier, uh, autonomous soldier, um, where we may have someday clients coming to our law office and or how that may be. Like, do you think that's something that we need to do federally? Is that is that a wise idea, or do you think it can be done regulated within existing regulatory frameworks, or is private law um, also a means or a, a, enough, basically, a sufficient means? Well, uh, already in the United States, uh, a number of states like Nevada and others have uh, adopted certain law, some laws that deal with drones. And for instance, in Nevada, you cannot carry any weapons on a drone. 
uh, and also there's uh, uh, you will see uh, it, my article. It, it, this talk, uh, you know, is a summary of an article I've just published uh, published in the Journal of Law and Technology, which will appear uh, this summer, and you will see the footnotes and our, our role. Of this is footnoted. And, uh, but there is, there is a lot of legislation that is being passed in the US dealing with drones and, and they're both regulatory and uh, it cuts across both the common law, law of torts and, uh, uh, and also uh, the uh, regulations of the aviation uh, uh, regulations. So uh, you may want to consult uh, some of these, uh, put it on Google there and you'll see the list of, uh, of the states that, uh, and we should do that too in Canada because there's a great danger. I mean, for instance, uh, you were speaking about the delivery of package you know, by Amazon, you know, uh, what if there's a collision or, or something? Well, the, the general principle of the law of thought would still continue to apply, but because of the, uh, uh, there could also be a violation of some of the rules adopted besides the law of torts uh, adopted, which would then imply responsibility. Just like uh, I mentioned at the state level, when I say that uh, existing uh, international law of state responsibility, uh, which is based on the law of torts too, uh, provides for reparation. And that would also play uh, if a state uh, owning uh, lethal weapons or super intelligent weapon doing something wrong would be responsible. Uh, but uh, one doesn't exclude the other. So, uh, but- So complementary would be correct. Yeah, well, the, uh, the, the, the common law would adapt to that. But, uh, but what is interesting, as I said before, is that uh, states are becoming aware of this and this is why they are adopting I mean, you might see the law of the valley is a little bit stupid. You can't carry arms because people were using drones with weapons uh, that were unmanned, you know? Well, except for the person, uh, but no one in the air or anything. And so, uh, but I mean, it's, uh, it's like uh, you, you saw the film there, I don't know if one of you saw it, was a series there of uh, Homeland and, uh, you know, and so you're just cozy there, you know, you're going, you're in Nevada there in your office there, and uh, you're just uh, shooting at the uh, uh, weapons uh, from uh, a drone uh, in Afghanistan, and you go out for lunch, have a nice time, have a beer, then go, go home and take the kids out uh, for a football game in the meanwhile, you have killed about a, uh, a number of people, you know, as a collateral damage, it's nothing, you know, <laughs> who cares? And uh, uh, I'm telling you, but uh, it's, uh, you mentioned of my experience in the resistance and so on, and uh, it, uh, it's quite a trauma, you know, uh, killing people. <clears throat> Thank you for the talk. Uh, on the topic of uh, killing people, my question is in relation to robotic warfare. Uh, you mentioned that you, you're against that as a uh, as as an idea because it may be difficult for the uh, robot to distinguish a civilian from a uh, from an enemy target. Uh, but you also mentioned that these computers can now make trillions of computations a second, uh, and we all know that humans are quite likely to make errors uh, and also maybe unethical. Um, so could you foresee a circumstance or a, you know, based on having very specific algorithms, rules uh, that are set to these robots that you know, they could uh, come in as a tactical squad uh, and are able, maybe able to distinguish an enemy from a civilian, uh, maybe able to find out if this person has a weapon or doesn't have a weapon before taking an action. And could you see that as a means of maybe instead of having large scale warfare, you know, sending in a few of these robots to take out someone like, for example, Osama bin Laden, uh, coming in, going out without killing any civilians. Uh, I do agree with you that drones take a lot of collateral damage, but I feel that that's just by design. I'm not sure that's a limitation on the robots themselves or the machines themselves. Um, what are your thoughts on this? And if it is possible, would you 
I support it. What I mentioned there is that the, uh, the difficulty is uh, to uh, impart a uh, moral principle or even the principles of the Geneva Convention into the robots. Now, <clears throat> you see, uh, uh, it's the same. I mean, we can do in different circumstances things that uh, are not programmed, you know, this is where a quick draw uh, situation. Uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, they are working on it and uh, they are reaching a point where I wouldn't be surprised within the next five years uh, they would be able to have uh, software that would impart uh, some of, uh, of human uh, principles uh, of compassion and so on uh, to, uh, so that would enable the, uh, at the moment it's not possible, the, the robot will do what it's programmed to do, but uh, the collateral damage is, is uh, very possible because it doesn't have the ability that you and I have in, in certain circumstances to decide at the last minute, no, this is a civilian, I'm not going to do this or that. But eventually, <clears throat> I'm sure that uh, from what I have read and doing my research, that uh, we're not far from, uh, and this is why I think that uh, it's a good thing, but in a way it neutralizes the advantage that uh, if you're putting too many principles uh, in, uh, in the robot's uh, uh, software, uh, you don't get uh, the advantage of, uh, of these machines, uh, uh, which is a, a very bad way of, uh, of, of saying it, but uh, uh, some states would not want the, uh, necessarily to have their uh, uh, artificial intelligent machine uh, show compassion, you know, or distinguish between civilian and uh, and uh, belligerents. Uh, but we're, I personally think that it would be a good uh, a good thing to try to impart those human feelings in a, in a, in a robot. But the more they become like us, then they move away from us and become even better than we are. Maybe. They w maybe we could eliminate war, you know, you, you never know, because uh, if they're super intelligent, uh, I mean, we're, we're the worst type of, uh, of uh, animals, you know, uh, that exist on this planet because we destroy, I mean, if you look back, uh, uh, one of my son who is a scientist uh, uh, in astronomy and so on, always say there are only two imperatives, you know, and uh, one is, uh, uh, reproduction and the other one uh, is uh, uh, safety, you know, uh, uh, and uh, it's you kill or I get killed. <laughs> and so maybe we can eliminate all of that. Maybe those uh, super uh, intelligent robots, maybe <laughs> they become better than we are. Because if you look at the history of humanity, I mean, it's been a, a disaster from day one, you know, uh, have killed one another. Right, left, and center. Uh, I'm going to have two last questions. This one about Professor Scott. Yeah, very quickly, ladies and gentlemen. This was an uh, eye opening and immensely important and for everybody. I uh, saw the poster. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's, um, it's also not just uh, law schools not getting their minds around it, it's, I think, all sectors, and it, Canada in particular tends to be a uh, kind of a complacent society when it comes to being at the cutting edge of of almost anything and that includes parliament political parties um, just as a story uh, about a year ago i drafted a, a motion that would put uh, pressure on the uh, federal government to create a process for studying fully autonomous uh, weapons um, report to parliament and the whole goal would have been just to start some pressuring so that we're actually further ahead in our thinking and at least there's some kind of a democratic awareness and um, because it was outside my immediate area as, as a official opposition critic uh, for the NDP, I talked to my colleagues in defense and foreign affairs and it was so far off the radar screen um, for them, plus that kind of rolled in this idea of almost this borders on being kooky, right? To worry about this kind of stuff. It's almost science fiction, it's almost uh, 
uh, conspiratorial. Why would you worry about this until there's a reason to worry about it? I mean, they didn't say it that way, but in the end, it was just the kind of thing they thought, no, there's not enough, there's not enough uh, pressingness and importance for us to somehow or other risk getting labeled as uh, the kooky NDP wanting to talk about fully autonomous weapons. So I just think the lack of, the lack of thinking about this kind of stuff just permeates and and so I'm glad you're suggesting that even uh, certainly at law schools, there's a place to start uh, and uh, other places as well. The uh, two quick comments. One is weaponization. We tend to think about uh, mobile weapons, either robots in the, in the physical human sense or uh, fully autonomous drones, et cetera. I mean, probably my biggest worry is, is so much of that still will depend at least for um, the, the primary stages on humans uh, setting in, in place the manufacturing processes and the uh, production processes to produce the things that can be mobile and then be dangerous because they're mobile and intelligent. My biggest worry is just computer networks on their own and the weaponization possibilities of just stationary uh, artificial intelligence and what it can do, everything from hijacking nuclear weapon systems to um, other kinds of, uh, of attacks on electrical grids and all that kind of stuff. And the question is uh, whether or not uh, that particular thing, just the idea of a Borg-like uh, taking over of uh, computer networks and systems, is that a distinct part of the discussion uh, that you've been able to see, or is it, it kind of marginal? No, no, it's not, and it's all intertwined with, uh, because you, uh, <clears throat> you can have like the Tiananmen there, the Chinese thing, that's it. Uh, it's a computer, supercomputer, and it's stationary. But we must not think exclusively in terms of robots that move like us. Uh, those machines can do much more harm in, than uh, even a robot can do. Uh, so we have to look at, and in, in my article, I, I point out, you know, it's machines that are stationary as well as the ones that are equipped with arms and legs. Uh, it's an offshot, but the, the super intelligent, uh, artificial intelligent machine is not necessarily a, a robot uh, that moves. Uh, and also it's intertwined, uh, uh, one of my sons, uh, as I said, I have several, uh, has written a, a seminal article in, uh, in the Journal of Law and Technology, also on cyber warfare, where he suggests all kinds of, uh, of uh, solution that should, that Canada should take, but they never paid any attention to it. Uh, it's, um, you might, I can send you the, the reference because they, they, it's all tied together and uh, you were speaking about take the grid, you know. Uh, this is what worries me, you know, because uh, they're becoming so sophisticated that uh, they could finish the electricity in the US because all the grids are interconnected. And then what are we going to do with our electricity? Not just uh, for a day or two, a few hours, but until everything is repaired and redone. Lots of people will die. I mean, no water. I live in a high rise. I mean, I even, though I'm still in good shape, close to 90 years old, but I can't walk 21 steps, 21 floors to, uh, with the groceries, you know? Lots of people will die. And so uh, I think that our previous government, uh, I mean, I sent this uh, even to, uh, I sent this another article that I wrote with, uh, on the question of, uh, uh, I can send it to you, to, uh, uh, to our ministers. And if nobody, uh, uh, or even your friend Dion, never even bothered to answer about it. So uh, whether they're conservatives or liberals, you know. <laughs> Uh, but uh, this, this is not science fiction. This is, uh, it's an easy uh, cop out, you know. Oh, it's science fiction. This has never happened. Well, look at the, uh, the Turing uh, notion of accelerating uh, science and invention and everything. Look at what happened in the last hundred years compared to the 10,000 years since the last glaciation, you know? And it, we're, it's going to be more and more and more, you know? And uh, they say 100, uh, uh, 2,000 and, uh, and uh, uh, well, 21, 
at the end of the 21st century. It may come. Uh, I wrote an article on science and, uh, and the law in, uh, in, uh, uh, for the Canadian Bar Review, which was uh, what would be the, because uh, I wrote the first transplant, legal consequences, and so on. Because as I said, I, I have a, a, a scientific background. And all the things I predicted there uh, in biology and in, uh, in other areas have occurred already. And uh, it's just accelerating so much. So we shouldn't dismiss that by just saying, oh, this is a lot of BS, you know. Uh, uh, it never will happen. It will happen. And so we better be prepared. And I think that we can take advantage of uh, artificial intelligence uh, if, we are, if we approach it the proper way. Uh, because it can bring a lot of benefits uh, to humanity. One more question. Do you believe that the, uh, an artificially intelligent or super intelligent computer or robot should be excluded from intellectual property protection, either the final product or any of the necessary components? To give an example, if a private corporation had control either of the final product or any necessary component through, say, for example, patent law, that would give it an enormous amount of power. So should there be any special approach to that issue? Well, the approach I propose is that uh, to be uh, uh, a, a common enterprise uh, and, uh, and then the product with a common heritage of mankind, you see. It, it wouldn't be able to be appropriated by anyone. It would be, uh, the, it belonged to the whole community. And uh, so everyone could, you can get a license uh, to produce this or that or use the, the, uh, the supercomputer there uh, by paying a fee, uh, but you cannot appropriate it. So you can rent it from the government uh, or not necessarily the government as such, but an agency that would own all the, uh, the knowledge uh, like uh, like the uh, the space station, for instance, nobody owns a space. If, if I can ask a follow up, in the area of nuclear fusion for energy production, there is a general international effort, but there are also private corporations working on it using slightly different ideas. And who knows which will get to it first? In other words, it's possible, even though there's a general international effort, it's possible that a private corporation could get to fusion technology before. So. One would have to address that, I think, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, it's very rare that we have someone who comes to speak to us who is fought in the French resistance. So Professor Castell has just uh, <laughs> acknowledged that he's about to turn 90. So to have somebody come, like Professor Castell, come to speak to us about a topic of such pressing future implications, I think is remarkable. I just feel that I've been uh, privy to the wisdom of the ages today. So please join me in thanking Professor Castell. <laughs>